Thank you very much. Welcome to the Blues panel at the first annual Blues Summit. And I thank everyone who's come into the room and all our panelists today. I'm Holly Harris from WUMB, and I am the moderator. And I got the idea from this panel um, going to the King Biscuit Festival, where uh, Roger Stoley had a panel of juke joint owners and festival owners. And I found it so fascinating uh, that I thought this would be a great idea when John was talking about having a blues summit. So I want to start by introducing our panel, and I'm just going to um, say the names out loud. Uh, on my left here, Charlie Abel from Thunder Road Music Club and Bistro, formerly of Harper's Ferry, Boston Blues Society co-founder and the Winter Island Blues Festival. Uh, Mr. Paul Benjamin, North Atlantic Blues Festival, Gloucester Blues Festival, and also chair of the esteemed um, Blues Foundation in Memphis. So very exciting as well. Mike and Brad Benton, from the White Mountain Boogie and Blues Festival, and also their festival won a KBA Keep the Blues Alive Award as a great festival, which we know it is, all these. Kathy Spencer from the Narrow Center for the Arts, thank you for coming. Uh, John McKinnon, Johnny Mack, booking agent and music director for Blues and Brews Festival. Uh, Eddie Page is not with us, but he's with us in spirit from the Next Page Cafe. And George Tachi from the Bull Run Restaurant and Concert Hall. So a hand for our panelists here. Yeah. I want to start by, um, you know, in thinking about this, I want to start by having each um, person, maybe we'll start at that end this time, uh, just tell a little short introduction of themselves, their, their venue, and a history of the venue. Because there's so many different ways that people got into the business, and maybe a little bit about how you get into the business. And if and if I end up saying we have to move on, please don't think I'm rude. We only have so much time. So let's start with uh, Johnny Mack. Uh, a little uh, history of your your event and how you got into this crazy business. Sure, we started in uh, 2001 in Westford, Mass, and it was started by a woman that actually wanted to have a beer festival and needed to pair it with some music. Me being a printer. She needed a program book for a festival. So she came in, I got all excited about it. I was always a blues fan. So from then on, we been, had been a pair. Um, she had been doing the beer aspect and I had been doing the blues aspect. But, and it's moved from a couple of different locations, but currently, for the last probably seven or eight years, it's been over at the Neshoba Valley Ski Area in Westford, Mass. Uh, it draws probably about 2,000 people or so. This is our first year where it's gonna be a two-day festival, August 20th and 21st, right up against White Mountain Boogie for the first time. Uh, yeah, I was a little nervous about that too. <laughs> That's why you're in a great festival. Right, yeah. They have a great festival. So, uh, so I've just been a blues fan and I'm just really interested in promoting it and, um, and uh, seeing the festival grow. Great. How about you, George? Uh, the Bull Run, a brief history of the Bull Run. We started in 1740. Most recent, the Bull Runs always had music of some kind there that I know of, all from ballroom dancing through show to, uh, you know, uh, community theater, chorus lines. Um, I picked it up. I was, I've been a musician my whole life, so I was always the guy in the band that went out and got the gigs. That's how I get into poking by accident. And, um, I got into running a show, and I was living in New York City, and they called me up, they were running a folk show out of the Bull Run, and the guy who was booking it had left. Can you help me out? And I said, yeah, I can do it for a month or two until you get somebody new. So here I am, uh, 15 years later, I expanded it a bit, and I quickly found out that blues was one of our biggest you know, audiences, so that became, uh, we're still fairly eclectic, but blues is definitely the front line. Still going strong, so tell all your friends. <laughs> um, I work at Narrow Center for the Arts in Fall River. A little bit of a history is we, we were not in the mill building we are in now. We originally started at an art gallery called the Renaissance Gallery um, down between the two war type of ponds in Fall River, and uh, it was taken over by eminent domain. Mm -hmm. So we had to move, and 15 years ago we moved to a mill building in Fall River. We had to move out all the sewing machine equipment that was in there, and we still have some of it, and we use it for our furniture a little bit. Um, I, know I see some folks that have been to the Narrows over the years, and we used to have all church pews in there. 
we've moved the church pews out. We now have cushioned seating. It's kind of comfortable for everybody. Um, we do about 140 shows a year, a lot of blues because blues draws. How I got started in it is we are mostly a volunteer organization. We have four employees. I was a volunteer for about 10 minutes and they asked me to come on staff. Uh, we have, there are two full-time employees, two part-time employees, I'm a part-timer. Um, and that kind of translates into full-time work. It's anybody that is in the music business on our end knows that it's a lot of work. Um, but we do it for the love of it. And that's pretty much what the narrative is all about, is for the love of music. Hi, my name is Charlie Abel. I, um, I get into this business uh, uh, back in hmm, 1984. Um, but um, uh, I, uh, I owned Harper's Ferry for 18 years. I absolutely love uh, uh, producing shows. I love blues. I got interested in blues in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, and um, the, uh, the I, I, I had to sell the club because I wanted to bring up my children. And uh, so I did that and got them off to college and I got a phone call from someone that I hired to take my place at Harpers Ferry as far as the booking is concerned, and um, ended up buying uh, uh, Thunder Road in, uh, in Somerville. It's a, it's a new venue, and uh, we opened our doors on September 8, 2015. I'm not even a year old. Um, we're, uh, we're getting blue shows in more regularly now. Uh, we have five shows coming up in the near future. Um, I'm extremely excited about uh, Producing blues and R&B at, at Thunder Road, and uh, the, uh, the the club business is something that uh, if you don't love it, you better you know, have someone else do the work for you. Now, where is Somerville? Is it Somerville Max? is <laughs> just outside Boston. Okay. It's uh, maybe about a mile from downtown Boston, so it's actually very close. Some of us are actually closer to Boston than parts of uh, Boston proper than parts of Boston like Brighton and Dorchester. Some of us are only a mile down the road. I mean, the bus is only a mile down the road from some of us. So it's very close to Boston. Public transportation is, is something we're working on there. But um, I mean, there's big buses, and, but we were supposed to have the T um, start, but that's uh, another issue. That, <laughs> for another day, but I'm um, very excited to be on this panel. Um, blues is uh, very dear to my heart. Uh, my name is Paul Benjamin. Uh, I guess I've been doing it a little bit long. I've, I've been bringing blues into Maine since 1978. Started booking uh, bands and uh, festivals. I do a number of festivals around the country. I consult the festivals around the country. I also uh, do all the blues shows at the uh, Time Out Pub and in that room I've been there for the past 20 years and I did them at the Trade Winds prior to that. Been doing a lot, you know, uh, Monday night series, uh, for, you know, which goes over tremendously. Uh, I've been doing national tour of bands, you know, uh, pretty much to, uh, February through December. I kind of take January off and head down south, but uh, that's because I do a few festivals down in Florida as well. So. And as Holly mentioned, I'm also involved with the Blues Foundation. I am sitting right now the current uh, chairman of the board. My second go around, I was chair of the board with the Blues Foundation uh, years ago when I uh, took, uh, you know, left, left the board after six years to four years and went back on when the Blues Foundation opened up the uh, Hall of Fame and got reelected to the board and now chair of the board. So, uh, so I'm, in, I'm back and forth in Memphis uh, often, but uh, you know, uh, Blues is what, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's the heartbeat of life, so. Yeah. Brad Benton, White Mountain Boogie and Blues Festival. Um, my, myself and my brother Mike started our festival 20 years ago. Uh, we have a family farm of 150 acres up in New Hampshire. And uh, we played music in high school and we knew that this little, we had an amphitheater on the property, which is perfect for a stage, and our big dream was eventually we're gonna 
make it well the music business come back and use that little area for ourselves. Of course, that didn't happen. But I know. We, tried, we tried for 15 years. Yeah. To do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right now, we're only doing music and we thought we'd come back and have a big homecoming, you know. Mm. But we want to stay in the music business anyway. Um, so we knew the amphitheater was there. So we started, we put up a little makeshift uh, stage with a uh, tow line trailer and a tent. Put our first festival with our band and some local friends and we started the it that way. <laughs> we cooked the food, we cooked the music, and we were also the sanitary engineers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the one quarter party and probably the six people that came. <laughs> but, and then, um, Myself and my girlfriend Robin went to Maine uh, on vacation and just happened to stumble across this little festival up in <laughs> Maine. <laughs> and we went on a Sunday afternoon and saw Shemeek Copeland and uh, Don Tyler Watson and some other people. And I went back to uh, my brother and I said, I think I found something. And, and we knew the direction at that point that we were gonna go in. We were always music lovers, but then we said, and intentionally it was to pay, help pay taxes on the farm so we could keep it green and not develop it like the rest of our town was becoming condominiums and houses. And we wanted to keep it 150 acres of green open area, so. And we were able to overcome a $20,000 tax deficit by using this Blues Festival. Yeah, and the Blues Festival gave us direction and it just grew and who knew 20 years later we'd still what we're doing. Yeah, I'm glad we do. Yeah, we are too. Uh, you know, and as I'm looking around, not only are there friends here in Blues, but family members of pretty much all of you are, are here in the audience. So mm -hmm. it's really nice to see next generation. So very exciting. So I'm going to open this up to the panel. In, in thinking about the changes in the world, I certainly know from being on the radio all the different changes. Um, what are, what are um, would you say, some of your greatest priorities are? Whoever would like to start. What are, when you think about your priorities, what would be some of them for your event or your, your uh, venue? Finding younger, yeah, newer acts that can draw. Finding yeah. newer acts? Yeah, younger, well, not necessarily younger, but newer newer acts. That, right. Because it's, it's easy to book the mainstream established kind of, and it's good because mm -hmm. they fill the room. But they're also getting older. And you need younger people to come up can fill the room, they're talented, they can, you know, are exciting. Yeah. I think part of that right. too is, is we're always looking for a younger audience. Right. right. And so, right. Uh, not just the That's performers, right. yeah. but the audience mm -hmm. as well. Right, you have to attract the younger audience. Anybody else? And, and definitely project, you guys. Well, I, kind of, I kind of think the younger audience is coming uh, from our point of view at the festival. We have people that brought their kids, now yeah. their kids are bringing their kids, so it, hopefully it's the, the genre is gaining popularity from people who have been brought into it by their parents maybe, or you know, not, not, that, not that that helps in a club situation where you have a drinking age right. situation, you know. Right. I think that the, uh, the crowd is, is growing, you know. Yeah. And we also, <coughs> to try to keep the numbers up as well and draw new people in that have families. Um, we, we run ours where if uh, you have kids that are 13 or under, they can come in free. It is a blues and brews festival, um, but there's we don't have an incident whatsoever with the, the beer aspect of it. And we do have kids that come in and we encourage that because some people just can't, you know, they, they can't have their kids go somewhere for the day or for the weekend. So I think that I think that helps allowing them to bring kids at no cost. Yeah. And um, you know, and it's it's and it's a family event. Yeah, my my uh, I'm sorry. Uh, my priority as far as my venue is concerned is to because we're new is to promote uh, Thunder Road uh, as a, uh, a place to see blues, and um, you know the uh, the landscape just changed as far as the advertising and promotion of, uh, of a venue or a uh, or a, uh, a festival, 
And uh, it's not, uh, you don't call the Globe calendar and, and speak to Steve Moss and, yeah. and, uh, and get plugs and uh, put an ad in the Phoenix and uh, do some radio advertising. It's not just uh, radio advertising, this is tough these days. And, uh, uh, social media is the name of the game. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that down, right, you're in trouble. And uh, so that's uh, something that we're in the process of doing for a new venue. So. So uh, one of my pri big priorities is to get all of those ducks in a row so that uh, we can reach out to everybody. Yep. And uh, the and younger people the is exactly what we need to do. Yes. I find educating the purist, blues purist, on the new wave of the blues. Uh, you have blues purists that uh, will not support the new age of rock blues in the blues you know, expands to so many genres now that, you know, getting, you know, at the festival, I always bring in a few unknown acts that I know nobody's ever heard of, because I know, you know, the Alvin Bishop, so those people are gonna fill up the seats. But you gotta educate, you know, the older audience to accept the new way of the blues. And is you know, and, and that's, sometimes there's a balance in act. You get some people, you know I mean, you know, you know, the Muddies and the, and the, and the Wolves and, and BB, they're gone. There's a no you know, wave, you know, wave of artists coming up that need the support of the older generation of blues fans, but we need to bring in the younger generation of blues fans to support the new wave of blues. And so that's always a challenge, even at the club level or <laughs> on the festival level. Is, and so if you can try to use your venue as an education point of kind of mixing that in and you know, I'm lucky where I'm at. We have a great rapport with the press and that. I mean, every show I get in, there's a picture of the artist and there's a story. So, you know, you know but of course we've been doing it for 35 years. So, uh, but, you know, it's, it, it makes it, you know, a little bit more doable. But, you know, I, I just think keeping the blues artist and educating the blues <coughs> fan is, is very important. Um, when, uh, uh I first started out in, in this business, uh, I wanted to promote blues, um, and um, Holly and, and I and Rick Russell and uh, Mark Ryder decided to form the Boston Blues Society. Karen Lifesaker and Watermelon Slim. Karen Lifesaker and Watermelon Slim, that's right. Oh, no. And uh, so um, we knew that in order to, to get the word out there that the young people were important, and we, we had a lot of young people go to uh, to our shows. Including us at the time. Yeah, we were young. <laughs> <laughs> but even younger than us at that point in time. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, uh, you, we just all have to, to make sure that, uh, as George said, that we, we, uh, we put our, our thoughts and efforts into getting young people out to see this, uh, this genre. Because if we don't, then you know what happens when we're all gone. Who's gonna pick up the torch? I think it's the same down south. Whether it, you know it, it's a different makeup of people, but it's the same thing age-wise. If you go to some of the festivals, all, all these points are really important, no matter where you live. I mean, it's a great genre that we love and and culture, and we want to preserve it, which is one of the the um, tenets of the Blues Foundation you know, to preserve this. So it's really, all these are great. Um, what about safety issues? Is that an issue? I know, like, down, when I, at the panel down south, there were a lot of safety concerns in some of the clubs. Do you guys have that at all here? Or is that not a big issue? It's always, it's always an issue. It's safety, an issue. You mean the safety you know, of what Apple Safety for, for the client. Oh, for the customers. For the customers. She said she's just talking about what probably we yeah. have to comply with the city oh, and yeah. your, your state uh, if you're doing a, uh, or your county for outdoor festivals. Right. Uh, Even numbers of people, I remember right. certain well, clubs would you know have more right. than they should. Well, everybody time. should have crowd control. Yeah. 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 One of the things that everybody in my club does. Well, how does that work for attention you? to an outdoor festival is the weather. You know, nowadays you don't know if there's going to be a cell that moves through, so you know, keep an eye on. You. There's an app you can get for your phone and give you a warning if something's going to come through because 
there are tents and easy ups and all the stuff that can easily disappear. Terrible. Well, sure. an issue. Yeah. So do you have that, like you have riders and, you, and contracts of weather issues? They're not worth anything. Not worth it. We okay. were in the town. Yeah, I took rain insurance out on Winter Island. Yeah. I missed it by like, I don't know. Two trucks. Eighth of an inch. Yeah. So I lost like $20,000 because I didn't bring one more eighth of an inch. <laughs> it's never. It's not about balance in the yard. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, if you're wrong, no, no. I'm always suspect of their measurement. We've, no, we've right. looked at we've looked at rain insurance and that sort of thing, and it just it's it it's not it's not way in your favor whatsoever. This no. the collection points are yeah. in, in strange areas, and it just yeah. it doesn't it's never going to be balanced in your favor. We had one year where we had heavy rain, and it seemed that. The rain would stop as we were setting up a band, right when the band get on, two songs in, downpour. <laughs> and then it'd be fine the rest of the way. And it just, it was like Woodstock after a while, and the giant huddle out front, hey, everybody hunkered down and got in the cars, or hunkered down and then stop, and everybody come back out. That was the only close call year because there was the threat of a heavy, heavy um, storm coming in with lightning and all that. So there was a decision that needed to be made. And uh, we, we just, push through rather than saying we're going to bring it indoors, which, <laughs> which would have been a very difficult thing when you have 2,000 people outside wondering what's going on. But to, safety is first. I wanted to bring, safety is first. I wanted to bring that up because I know there's people in the audience who are thinking about maybe having a festival or, you know, or doing festivals and just kind of things that you, you do need a team and, and what some of the things to think about. You can, it's not, this is not a one person, um, that's in certain case, but you do need a team of people to work with. Um, and I and I don't know. I think segueing with that briefly, any major changes that you've seen since you guys have started long ago? Anything <coughs> that really stands out from when you began? Our audience is getting older. <laughs> <laughs> we need to get a younger audience. Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, sure. you know, and I mean that, and that's that's a given. I mean, if you go to any blues festival, any blues club, it's the average age is 50 years old and above. And it's, uh, you know, and, and fortunately we're having some of the younger bands, you know, like Samantha Fish or the Selwyn Birchwoods and the Mr. Sips and, you know, and Homemade Jams and, you know, and uh, <coughs> those artists out there uh, getting them into clubs and on, on festival venues is, is, is a good thing if you can get the local, you know, the local paper and if you put out, even on your Facebook and your social media, put out that you have these 16, 17, 18 year olds coming to your event, you might hopefully get one or two of their friends, or you know, you know, uh, people, you know, starting to gravitate and getting a younger audience. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, I've been doing festival, you know, for 25 years, and it's, you know, and, and it's just, I, I, my audience is almost the same, but now they're 25 years older, mm. and so uh, you know, and you know, so it's, it's, you know, getting that next generation of blues fans uh, to an event is is, is key. Uh, you know, I mean, blues is not going anywhere. It's the, you know, it's been here forever. It's going to stay here forever. But you know, we need to find ways to get the younger generation involved with, with in the blues world. Yeah. The blues audience that comes to shows now is probably forty and up. If we're lucky. And uh, um, I, I, back when uh, when I first started twenty five years ago. Uh, I think the average age was like 21 to 45, you know, it was a lot younger. Same group so, of people. Yeah, Same so we need to, in order to, keep the, in order to, keep, in order to continue to keep the blues alive and well, we need to, to, to channel our energy into getting young people in to see the, the shows. And I think a good way of doing this, excuse me, I think a good way of doing that um, on the festival side is to have, like, uh, uh, like we said, that um, you have the younger, younger acts in there to draw the younger people in, so they'll get to see the older acts, the older style of blues, so that they can get hooked. Uh, and once once someone gets hooked on the blues, they, you know, they're pretty much there. Yeah. Um, usually, I think things go out like a, a certain type of music will take over, and a new crowd will follow it, 
And then they start looking deeper into it and they dig down and they wind up at the blues because it kind of all originates. That's right. That's right. And, then, and so they, all of a sudden you have kids going like they just discovered Buddy Waters. Like, hey, I heard this guy. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but meanwhile, back, you know, call last back, in the, yeah. back in the, the 80s and 90s, remember how much uh, advertising on TV had blues background music? Yeah. Yeah. It was everywhere. Still and it's starting. Yeah, it it's starting to come. Uh, it's starting to come back much stronger than it has been in the last couple of years. I, so. I mean, every if you listen to, to to the background music on advertising on TV, see how many you count out of a, out of say twenty ads have a blues background of some sort, and uh, that's a good sign. I mean, there's an Edda. There's music with Edda. Yeah. You know, there's music with BB, mm -hmm. Blind Lemon, Cucumber. I mean. There, there's so many. I'm going to answer these two questions, and then at the end we're going to have time for some questions. It's really good. You, you has, yes. Um, just pressing on how do you get a younger audience? Uh, you mentioned Samantha. Yes. You know she's 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 great. She's 25 year old, one of the best rock and blues people out there anywhere. Many of you have had her, and yet and and I've been there to, for for just about all of you, and you still get the same 50 year old crowd. Yeah. Yes. So there's got to be more than just bringing in young talent. Bring, well, in she's an opening act, bring in an opening act that has a young following. Education. Yeah. And that education. I agree. Education. Bringing in an opening act that has a young following, but uh, there's a ticket price involved. That's right. Who has exactly. the expendable income That's right. to That's right. purchase that ticket? Right. And James, I agree with you. Uh, you know, you've been to every Samantha show that we've had. <laughs> and Anna and Shamika and uh, who is buying the ticket? Who could afford the ticket? Mm -hmm. Try to gear your festival to be as family friendly as it can be. <coughs> you know, for instance, we do balloon making and face painting and bouncy houses and climbing walls and fireworks. Trying to bring in the families with their young kids who can't, like, you know, need to bring them with them. And the young kids, like we said, are growing up and bringing their kids. <coughs> younger. And then bringing in the younger acts are also bringing in the younger crowd. We're seeing a Last few years, we're still actually starting to see a lot more people, a lot, a lot more hula hoop girlies up there and the younger college crowd and stuff. They're actually getting into the blues. And they wouldn't have, you know. And we, and we learned a long time ago, when we, when, the first, when we had our first and second show, it was a mixture of folk and blues and rock and a bunch of different things. And we had a big college crowd, but we also had vendors, so they paid a ticket to come in. And then they go to the car to eat their sandwiches and to get their drinks. They wouldn't really work with the vendors. So to get the age group that we have now, for us is a blessing because they do have expendable money, you know, to come in, buy a ticket, and, you know, work with the vendors too. Well, the 25 to 35 year old people certainly have an expendable income, and a lot of those are not married. So they got more expendable income than a lot of us. Because they, I mean, especially the, uh, uh, the young, uh, you know, professionals that are mm -hmm. the, uh, that are get you know six figure jobs in right. uh, out of college. Boston. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Terry, I'm going to answer your question, well, and then we're going to hold to the end. And yeah, it's, it's really uh, a two part comment. One, the uh, even though even though there the blues is still there as a background for advertising, younger people don't recognize that for what it is. Yeah, right. right. That that's sure. part of the issue now, and. Give you a quick example. Probably a month and a half ago, I called my nephew who lives on the Cape and said, Hey, look, I haven't seen you for a long time. Why don't you come up to the Shanty Rose? There's blues there on Thursday nights, and it's just about the music. It's not like a nightclub. And he was a foot away from the bass player, Paul Justice, and he was in the horn player. He was absolutely stunned because he'd never been that close to music before. And he's, you know, 26, 27, but. After that, to get him back out to come see something, even here, I said, why don't you come on up? I called him, and he, he just, and I think part of it is the expendable income, even though he would have had a free pass. Uh, he's also like too tired because he's working too many, too, like, two jobs and stuff like that just to make a living wage. And there's a huge group of those young people that are doing that because of what's been happening economically. Too. So they, you know, that kind of, that Paul makes sense. on this too. Education. I yeah. certainly like T.J. Wheeler in Maine and, and blues in the schools with Art Capaldi who's here today. We, we, and Jimmy Bez is in the back, younger musician. You know, I think education is really key. And, and I, when I was teaching English in school, I'd play a little Coco Teller of B.B. King and the kids would laugh, oh, they're funny names. And then 20 years later, they come back and they go, 
B.B. King, Coco Taylor, I know who that is. You know, I run into them. So I think education is definitely a big part of it. And, um, the Blues Foundation does that, supports that. Yeah, Blues Foundation has Generation Blues. Actually sends a lot of kids with the scholarship to Blues Camps. Uh, you know, we have the International Blues Challenge, and we have a youth showcase. Uh, that's something that when I was president of the board the first time that I put into place that every artist in that youth showcase has to be under the age of 20. And these kids get to play on Beale Street. And uh, it started out with uh, one or two, three artists coming in. Uh, last year there was over 60 <coughs> artists under 20 years old playing on Beale Street uh, during the International Blues Challenge. And it's grown every year. So that's one way that the Blues Foundation is helping. And the Blues in the school is also a very important uh, you know, piece of the project. So you know, the more Blues in the school programs that happen, all well, those you know, those are kids you're talking to, and uh, you know, and that's who, uh, you know, and you know, uh, in in Rockland, the last couple of years, we've decided that you know, there's a blues, there's a music school that opened up right next to the festival. Uh, we let the kids open the festival. We have an artist come in and that's going to play with them for a couple of days, and they're going to open the festival. Uh, you know, they're going to have 15 minutes on the stage. You know, with, so the, all the, these young kids are going to be there playing, and their parents will let them in for the, for free if they want to stay for the day they're in. You know, and we did this, this festival I just did on St. John Virgin Island in March. We did the same thing. We had Deanna Bogart come in and work with the kids in the school for a week, and they opened the festival. So that's a good way to get the kids involved in the music and also wants to get on stage and they get that little taste for it. So uh, there's, there's ways out there, but you got to look at it and, 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 you know, and go to go to blues.org, which is the Blues Foundation, and all that stuff is there. And it's such a great organization because it also, uh, with membership, you can go to Memphis and go to the Blues Hall of Fame, which is phenomenal, and you know so many museums. The Stack Museum next door to the Stack Museum in Memphis, there's the the school that they support, which is the kids not only learn math and science, all learn music, and you know. So <coughs> I think education is, is a key part of it. And IBCs are a great place to uh, research your up and comings and your and your bands that you want to fill in between the, the names that you have at your festivals. Once they go there, you can, you can see all kinds of great talent. And the ones that have won awards almost bounce right into the festival immediately mm -hmm. and just got really getting noticed. And, and, and today alone, we have uh, Boston Blue Society, New England, Connecticut, New Hampshire. A lot of folks are here, and I agree with you. I think it's a showcase of talent. You know? So let's move on to something a little bit different. Um, are there any funny or interesting stories of uh, musicians that you'd like to share with us. This kid is right. <laughs> Sorry, this children out there. <laughs> we all have those. <laughs> well, I have a clean one. Uh, um, you know, I, uh, I booked uh, Bo Diddley uh, probably 12 times at Harper's Party. So the first time I, uh, um, I, I booked him, I, I picked him up at the airport and um, <coughs> Um, uh, I said, uh, Bo, do you want to go to your hotel? And he goes, uh, no, Charlie, I want to go to Guitar Center. I said, oh, okay. So, um, uh, and so we go to Guitar Center, and um, he said, uh, where's the manager? So he gets the manager. So the manager comes over, he goes, and we go, Mr. Diddley. He goes, don't call me Mr. Diddley, call me Bo. And I said, oh, he said, okay, Mr. Bo, uh, what, can, what can we do for you? He said, yeah, can I? Yeah, see that strat over there? So, it, it, no, the other strat, the older one. So he, he, he gets a strat that's on the wall, and he sits down in the middle of the store and holds court and plays for about mm, half an hour. Oh. Every, every customer and everybody that worked in the store was surrounding him. There was nobody at the stations. People could have gone into the registers and taken the money. And, uh, but it was unbelievable. It was just a, uh, um, he plugged in right in the middle of the store and, and uh, it, was, it was amazing. Uh, and that, that was just something I will never forget. That was great. Did he buy the guitar? Yeah. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> he made his own guitars, you know. So um, I, uh, uh, that, that was just amazing. Yeah, Bo was uh, a special guy. And yes, he was. We had a lot of great shows. You had a good yeah. relationship with him. Oh, yeah. I went he to did the same thing uh, playing I when he played for me in Rockland. He showed up at the Sunday morning 
a brunch before the festival. Uh -huh. Walked in and sat down and started playing spoons and then sat in <laughs> yeah. with the band. And you know, and he just he did that for you know yeah. for a half hour. And then after the show, we sat there for two hours after the show taking pictures with people. He's um, he was unbelievable. And, you know, and just uh, yeah. but we had him. Remember when the rumor came out that he had passed? Mm -hmm. and was on CNN that he had passed right. and he was playing at my, my festival mm -hmm. that weekend. <laughs> <laughs> then I said, he was in town, we had picked him up at the airport, he was at the hotel, the people come up to me during the, the day before we were setting up and say, why are you still advertising Bo Diddley? He's dead. I said, well, if he's dead, he's at the hotel, we just picked him up. He's here, he is going to play by him. And then they finally come out with the retraction that he was alive. Oh, no. But it was, it was that weekend I had Bo Diddley give up on a Friday that he had passed away. You know, we had picked him up at the end. That's a great tag team story. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's, you know, that, but that's, that was, the, you know, that's right. Right. And he was there live and well, but I mean, it was there at, you know, when he was, you know, yeah. was on the news, I'm watching the news. Bo Diddley died. <laughs> now, when he did die, he's in my car. He's in my car. When he did die, I, mean, I went to the funeral. Who's this guy in my car? I went to the funeral in Archer, Florida, and I drove up from South Florida. At that point in time, I had taken my sabbatical from the music business. I, I was I was gone from Harper's Ferry, and um, I it was a gospel funeral, and. Uh, I tell you, I, I sat on the second row next to his agent and his cousins, and the first row was all family, and it, it, it was, I'm glad I had strong kidneys, because it was a four-hour <laughs> funeral, and I was locked in on both sides, and I wasn't going anywhere, and it was unbelievable. Eric Burden uh, played at the, uh, uh, the reception afterwards with some other uh, <laughs> Great artist. It was just unbelievable. So, so that. Uh, yeah. and, and another quick story with, with, I mean, the first time that I went to Chicago, uh, Blue Stars, Eddie Shaw, who got me into business, invited me out. Make a long story short, so we're on time here, but he invited me to this after hours club with him. And I, I walked in, the, the, this is like a house, and it was two o'clock in the morning, and the two, the two guys at the door made me look extremely small. And I'm sitting at a table, and one of the bouncers come up and says, we're going to put some people at your table. Well, I'm a guest there. There's a little bandstand, there's people playing. So I'm sitting there, and in comes three people who sit down at the table with me. There's Bo Diddley, Keith Richards, and Chuck Berry. Oh, nice. Wow. Wow. Whoa. And I'm sitting, there, I'm sitting there at the table. Whatever Keith Richards was, had, he had it in the brown paper bag. And he <laughs> I called my wife the next morning. I said, I just died. You went to heaven. <laughs> We're going to believe what happened to me. And, you know, when I got home, people said, well, didn't you get autographs? Didn't you get pictures? Yeah, it's 2 in the morning. Yeah. It's their place. Yeah. It's, you're left alone. But I mean, that, that was my first experience yeah. in Chicago at 2 in the morning yeah. in the house wow. sitting with these three guys. Wow. So, that's, wow. a, that's a great story. That's a great story. Well, wow, Dilly was a good one to bring up. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody wow. else? John. Well, this is nothing compared to a dead doctor. <laughs> <laughs> but um, my whole family, my wife Teresa is here. And, my son and daughter have been involved with the festival since I've been involved with it. My daughter every year makes a plate of chocolate chip cookies for each band and gives them to the band after they're done performing. I just I always remember when we had Sugar Blue out, we handed him a plate of cookies, he grabbed it, walked into his bus, and ate the whole thing. Whereas <laughs> <laughs> the other ones would sit down and chill with me. He was gone. He thought it was his. He was gone. There you go. <laughs> We had Guitar Shorty, you know Guitar Shorty? Very well. Yeah, so he does the whole, that he took from Albert Collins, he walks out in the audience and goes outside. <laughs> so our, our place is a big sprawling old building with, it goes way down with rooms on each side and upstairs and downstairs and it's all convoluted. And so he went playing down the hall and of course the, his guitar is still playing in the main room and he got lost. <laughs> 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 yeah, I can see that. Yeah, he couldn't find his way back. And he's planning when walking through the main dining room and people are eating. <laughs> this guy comes through with an electric guitar which they can't hear. <laughs> he's playing and he's smiling. And he decided to go outside and he went around and he was banging on the stage. <laughs> Finally, he made his way in through the back and walked up on stage and everybody clapped. <laughs> that reminds me of when Lucky Peterson played Happers before he got, it, he got rid of the hash horseshoe bar. Yeah. He jumped up on stage, he had a, a wireless, uh, um, just like yeah, uh, yeah. Guitar did, and uh, he went around the entire bar, jumped off, 
went down the ramp and out on the median strip in front of the club and played the rest of the song. Yeah, and yeah. people had got their heads sticking out the window, uh, the, yeah. the door like this, one, two on top of each other looking at them. Yeah. Right. Unbelievable. Well, Albert Collins used to do that for years with a yes. hundred foot cord. Yes, Albert, 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 Albert started that. Exactly. Yeah. Funny guy in junior but, They have someone walking behind him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. straighten up yeah, that right. yeah. yeah. Debbie Davies used to walk behind him when she played with him. So. Charlie, I think that's a safety thing that she was talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Exactly. And, uh, another quick story with uh, Pine Top Perkins. If everybody knew Pine Top, he oh, loved yeah. the fish. He had a show in Ellsworth, and Buddy took him out on the boat to go fishing that morning. He didn't make the gig. He stayed out fishing. He missed his gig. He was on the fishing boat. They had to reschedule the next day. <laughs> Goodness. These are great stories. No, no. I just want to follow up with Guitar Shorty, and probably some of you know. Last week in LA, his, his van was stolen with all his equipment, oh, yeah. all his guitars, everything he owned wow. in LA. It was just on Facebook. So if you go on and you have the uh, wherewithal and you want to help out, the, the fundraising a little for Guitar Shorty. David oh, Kearney, it's under David Kearney, his regular name. He's a great Speaking guy. of Guitar yeah, Shorty, everybody knows how he, when he was younger, he used to do his yeah. flips yeah. off the stage yeah, and do yeah. a backflip on. He did that at our festival. He didn't realize we had a cement stage. <laughs> oh. After the show, he took him to the chiropractor. It's <laughs> <laughs> great. These are great stories. These are great stories. Anybody else have anything? Well, uh, we have a confidentiality policy at the Narrows. So we don't talk about a lot. <laughs> because we all know that there's a lot that goes on that we really can't yeah, share. Sure. Oh, okay. um, we, as you know, we do a lot more than just blues at the Narrows, and, and many of us have had what we call transportation duty, where we either have to pick somebody up or drop them off or, or whatever. Uh, we had Marty Stewart in. Marty Stewart's from Nashville. Um, Johnny <coughs> Cash was Marty Stewart's mentor, and he played. They played together for years and years. Uh, Marty's bus driver used to drive Glen Campbell. So they pulled in from a gig, you know, they had driven 15, 17 hours, I'm not sure, and he came in and Marty said, this is the first time in 30 years that I forgot my guitar strap. I don't know what to do. So he said, can you bring me someplace that uh, maybe has a belt? And he decided he would fashion his guitar strap out of belt. We had a Burlington coat factory in Fall River. <laughs> so his bus driver and Marty get into my car, and we're chit-chatting, they're having a conversation, and they're using um, initials, gossiping about what's going on in Nashville. Uh -huh. And it was so obvious, it was kind of funny. So we pulled into Burlington coat factory, they both got out, and I'm sitting there waiting, and it was about 10 minutes, and I thought to myself, people recognize them. What if they never come out? What if they're not? <laughs> and then I realized this is Fall River, Massachusetts. They have no idea who they are. <laughs> and they came out, they got in the car, got back to a, a wonderful gig, and two of the nicest people um, that I've really ever met. And I have to say just about everybody, probably 99% of the folks that come in are just wonderful, wonderful people. Blues artists are the easiest artists in the world to work with in any kind of music. Yeah, great yeah. That's and for us, too, to, to be able to just so walk right up. They appreciate the fans. They love it, yeah. Coco Taylor, B.B. King, two of the most gracious people, you know. And I remember the days when you could go up and B.B. was so accessible, just like you were saying with Bo. He never left until the last person he was <coughs> spoken to or taken, really? had taken a picture with him. And Coco Taylor was so gracious. I got to spend some time with her at the Winter Island Blues Festival, and she, she was just lovely. And I remember Albert Collins, um, toured with his own crock pot. And the first time I ever interviewed him, I was in a, it was in uh, Cambridge, and he was cooking his own food in a hotel. He was walking down the hall. <laughs> All kinds of crazy stuff. Anybody else have any uh, interesting stuff? All right, so let's continue on. Um, any, you know, joys and sorrows. I, I certainly know when clubs close, it's tough. When festivals don't go on uh, for another year for some reason, it's sad. When ra people don't get hired because the radio business changes. Um, anybody have any uh, woes that they'd like to share? Joys and sorrows? Mm. Mm. Joys and sorrows. You know, it, well, it, because this isn't, it's not a million dollar business, let's just say, all the yeah. time. <laughs> We're not in yeah, it for the money. All the, right. I mean, you do need to value yourself 
but there is a love factor here. It starts out as a million, but by the time you get down <laughs> yeah. to million, yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. it comes down to you. How right. do you yeah. make a million dollars in the blues world? You start, start out with two million. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to say that some of my greatest joys of the festival, and for the first 10 years uh, that we did it, uh, it constantly rained. Yeah. <laughs> Nine years. Yeah, every year. Nine years. Smile in the rain. And the joy was the fact that, that the people loved it so much that every year that you wanted to quit, you just couldn't because the audience just loved it so much and told you how appreciative it was that, that you did it. And, and every year you went back and did it again, you know, because they just, the crowd grew and they just really just loved what you were doing. Um, so that, that really is a joy when you have a, a successful weekend and you see the crowds leave and they're all shaking your hand saying thank you, we had a great time mm -hmm. and it's a wonderful thing. Um, the sorrow is when you wake up on Saturday morning and it's pouring rain on your v Lux mm -hmm. first day of your festival <laughs> and you got to get up and go up there and, <laughs> and, <laughs> it's, and you just don't know what to do at that point. But that's it, you know. It's, the festival is a, is, a, is a labor of love, because it isn't a million dollars. There's nothing better than to pull up, uh, in, in, in my case, uh, to pull up to the club, you know, after I've worked if, you know, hard for three days to make sure something has happened. And you go home, take a shower, and there's a line outside the club to get in, and, um, and the, to put on a show that is just, you know, Stella show. Everybody knows how it how it feels uh, since we've been in the business, and um, you know, it's just having people walk by when they leave, shaking your hands, and wow, what a great show! Yeah. I mean, the joy to me is when I see the audience enjoying themselves as much as the band is on the stage. Yeah. The interaction between the right. artists on the stage and the audience. You see everybody having such a great time. And it's like every one of us up here, we do not get to see our shows. Right. Yeah. I mean, most of the time, I mean, as a, as a festival model, when I'm putting on a festival, she's on the stage. I'm looking for him because he's up next. And you've got a whole bunch of things you've got to work and do. I mean, and, but when you go by the crowd reaction, you all of a sudden you hear everybody roar. And you, you know, you look out and you see the, you know, one of the artists in the audience, you know, in the, you know with, you know, with the audience. And, and they had come off the stage, and you just see that interaction, you know, and when, when that connection between the artist and the audience is the joy of, the best joy of any show. Right. I mean, in the, in the sorrow, technically is when it's over, but it's also the joy. <laughs> <laughs> After a festival, I mean, you, you, know, you, you know, you have that letdown that you just put on the show for, you know, uh, on a festival, and you, you work all year round to put that show on, and it's there, and it happened, it was great, and so you do have that, that letdown, but when that last band goes on the stage and you know it's done, you can sit back and relax and say, oh, this is great. And then the sorrow is, oh shit, we gotta clear this place up now. <laughs> we can start again for the following year, so. Yeah, I think, I think that joy part, part of it too is when you bring somebody in, I think people come to a festival to see someone that they know and then to discover, so called discover new band. Mm -hmm. So bringing in somebody that that you know is gonna, you feel is gonna go over really well, and it goes over really well, and people come up to you and say, I never heard of this guy, but they're fantastic. I gotta buy their CD. I mean, that's the satisfaction of it. And the sorrow, like Bob was saying, is is the day after it's over, and to me it's, I mean, the planning, kind of like life house, it almost <laughs> starts immediately, but it's it's like all that work, and it's like, your wedding reception. It's over like that. That's the result, all that planning, but you gotta, you enjoy the entire process. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, the, the joy is like, I got to meet a lot of the heroes and the people I really looked up to growing up, you know, the, the musical heroes. And uh, the sorrow is that I got to meet a lot of the, some of the musical heroes, <laughs> you know, because sometimes they're just not, you know, they don't go back to it. But no, 99% of them are great. Who's the family? Yeah, well, yeah, I wasn't thinking right. But that's a good point, too. Yeah. You know, and uh, this weekend, as you know, um, John Hall's dedicating uh, the festival to the uh, late great Otis Clay and also Candy Kane and several others that we've recently lost. So, you know, yeah. 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 good and bad. And then, and then uh, yeah. 
same with the artists, but when you do a festival for 20 years and you get people that are coming every year, you get to know these people, you know, and then sometimes, well, every year we have three or four people that have passed away that used to come to the festival. We put a, a memorial in our program every year for those folks that came to years. Oh, yeah, we're you, we're you, a very small venue. You joy, we you get to, to meet a lot of people, but you'll Yeah, that's what I see. Yeah, and yeah. that's what, uh, that's what we become uh, a family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we that's see the size. same people. It is, it's yeah. a great size. Yeah. And we see the same people coming in. They bring their friends in. And over the course of 15 years, you know, it's inevitable they're going to lose some. Right. And um, so it's, it, for us, it's both a joy to see new people, to see them time after time, and then to know that they've passed. It's sad. Mm -hmm. Terry had a question then. Art, yes. Uh, well, again, it's more an observation. We were talking about joys and sorrows, and I, I totally get the, the wonderful exhaustion at the end, and, and knowing you got to start all over again. But I, I've been in the photo fits at Paul's Festival for a number of years, and Mike and Brad's. And when I first started photographing, <coughs> I would shoot nothing, almost nothing but artists. And about two years into it, I started turning around and shooting the audience. Now I shoot the audience about 70% of the time because you see this joy, not only in appreciating, catching moments of appreciation and thrill and just being overwhelmed by artists, you catch it on the artist's faces as well, bouncing back and forth. But you also catch, as you were mentioning, as the family kind of grows over the years, and as a photographer, you see that as well. But you see this incredible string of connection over the years of the reunions of people coming to the festivals who meet new people at the festivals. And they, they may not see each other for a year. And they see each other at these different festivals they go to. Mm -hmm. And, and right. you see out in the audience. I, I know when you guys are on stage and you have time to see it out there, you see them connecting and you know, back slapping and hugging and, Again, they may not see, they may see each other for, you know, that, that 12 or 14 or 24 or 72 hours over the course of a week. They may not see each other for a year. And that, that, that connection that you guys create out of all of that is, is, is just, for me as a photographer, it's a great joy to see that and be able to capture that. And I just want to thank you guys for doing what you do. Well, I wasn't going to do questions right now, uh -huh. but let me just do art, and then we're going to move on, because I, I did say we're going to have them at the end. Yeah. I was just going to add on to what you all are saying and, and make us realize that even though we are losing a lot of our mentors in the music, we're also losing a lot of fans every year. And uh, we have, I know you were talking earlier about bringing youth into it, but uh, we have an older demographic, and we're losing as many fans each year as we're losing great artists, too. Exactly. I want to uh, take a pause. Thank you. Eddie Page has just come. I'm glad you're joining us. Thank you. Thank you from um, the next page. So he's now with us. So thank you very much. Um, we've, we've covered a little bit of ground. Um, I want to continue on. I'm going to throw in a question I hadn't asked. But I hope all of you get to pick up. I left on the chair uh, <coughs> outside all of our panelists and how to find them. So my question is, when people want to book a band or they want to come to your club or your venue. What's the best way to find you guys? Is it through an agent? Is it by calling you? Is it by emailing you, sending a press package? What, let me start down at this end. What's the best way to contact you for the White Mountain Boogie and Blues? Email. Uh, yeah, the email, email um, through me at brad at nhblues.com. But um, it's tough because there's a lot and a lot and a lot of bands that email me and want to get on the festival and it's hard to know them all um, and I do hours of research and listening and, and such. Um, that's the best way but a lot of the times it comes from me either seeing or hearing or researching um, the, the bands. Okay. All right. What about you, Paul? Uh, you know, social media works well this day and age. I, I'm old school. I like to be called. Uh, I will answer emails, but I, I can read a person so much better face to face or on the phone than I can with an email or a text message or you know a Facebook post. Uh, you know, uh, I'm fortunate. I do travel a lot, and I do get a chance to see a lot of new up and coming bands uh, with the, with the events that I do around the country, and you know, and being involved with the foundation. So. 
you know, I, I get to see a lot of these newer bands that haven't made it yet, especially at the IBC. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, Salem Birch was Jerika Singleton, Shanit, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, and those people like that, they all played the IBC. Mr. Sip, you know, they, you know, and a lot of them didn't win it at the IBC, but they were spotted at the IBC, so you can get them before they get, you know, so big that you can't afford them. <laughs> and, uh, and so that, you know, that happens, I mean, uh, uh, you know, so, you know, with, with today's social media, there's no excuse for any person out there not to be able to get any one of us. I mean, there's, uh, you know, if they say they can't get a hold of us, they're not doing their homework, and if they can't, if they can't find me, I probably don't need a book. I'm do not being mean here, but we're very accessible, and we're out, and we're seen, and they, if they know the club, they should know how to get a hold of the club. If they know the festival, they should not. I mean, every one of us have web pages and stuff, so there's really no excuse for not to be able to get a hold of, uh, of an, you know, of any one of us. Do you find, is it okay for the artist to contact you, or do they have to have an agent? No, I, I, there's a lot of artists that represent themselves this day and age, and there's a lot of artists that can't afford an agent, so I book a lot of independent artists, and, and I, you know, and they, they call me, but if they do have an agency, I would rather have their agency call me, because if the artist calls me, I have to call their agency anyway to see if the date's available. So if they do have an agent, they know to have their agent call, so it, it, there's a chain of command to get a hold of us, and, most artists you know, obey that, but a new artist is trying to get out there. I mean, I get artists, I'm sure every one of us on this panel gets called from artists that we don't know and ask us, you know, they want to send us something, and, and most of that comes socially, and you can look at it for 30 seconds and realize, you know, you know, I mean, you know, you know, I love it when I get the art thing and it says, you know, I play indie rock and I'd love to play you North Atlantic Blues Festival, you know, <laughs> or, or a bluegrass band calls me and says, oh, it would be great for your blues festival. Oh, you forgot it's not bluegrass, it's blues. You know, and if they don't do their homework, you get rid of those easy. But you know, we're all easy accessible, but you know, do your homework before you call us. Make sure you're calling us for the right reason. How about you, Charlie? What's the best way to find uh, Thunder Road? Um, well, we're uh, easily accessible on social media. Um, the telephone number is pretty cool, Two, uh, 617-776-ROAD. So I had to find that one. It wasn't easy. Um, at thunderroadclub.com. Um, my number is not so accessible. However, if you go to the um, the website, uh, the booking uh, process is clear. Um, today, back in the day, I used to have piles and piles yeah. of CDs. Right. I had a guy that used to come over to my house and get my CD covers. Yeah, because he did something. With but um, <coughs> um, it, it's, um, it, it's, it's, it's a totally different ballgame than it was back in the day. So we, we have a staff that, 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 that does all of the, the research on the, um, the, uh, the, the, the CDs that are sent electronically yeah. and the videos that are sent, okay. sent electronically. So okay. they review those. They determine whether or not the, the act is, is going to be able to do their part of it, which is to bring people through the door. A lot of acts say, well, we have a great band. And, you know, a lot of times they do have a great band, but they don't bring anybody through the door. It doesn't help them, and it doesn't help us, even if we try to bring them through by putting them with, you know, a full house. That's great, but we can only do that to so many artists. So, uh, but, to be the right uh, the the the, the uh, Lewis competition, which is now being held um, in October, uh, we're picking it up uh, where Johnny B's left off. We're starting uh, that, and that is going to help uh, uh, the the newer artists um, and uh, help them get uh, established in front of a lot of people. Um, so basically, getting in touch with us, social media, the club, um, and um, you know, we're easily reached. I'm not so easily reached, but I have been my whole life, so that's right. <laughs> How about the Narrows? Um, uh, I don't do the booking. Our talent buyer is Patrick Moore, and he does all the booking. I answer the phones, though, and I can tell you calling is not the easiest thing to do because, you know, like all of you, 
we get phone calls that say, you know, I represent so and so, they'd be a great fit for your place. Yeah. Um, and one thing I do miss is the stack of CDs that we used to get. And I want to say probably up until about um, 18 months, a year ago, we continue to get press kits that way. And Patrick would give me the CD and say, listen to this, tell me what you think. <coughs> and it would be an easy turnaround. You know, I'd listen to it in the car on the way home, come back in the next day and say yes or no, and pursue it from there. Um, and I kind of miss that. Uh, yes, social media is the, is the big thing now. Uh, I like something to hold in my hand, and I, I miss the CD, so continue to send your CDs to the Narrows because I like to hear them. Um, emails, if Patrick's email is the best way to get in touch if you want to book something at the Narrows. If he ignores it, if you don't hear anything for a week, two weeks, forget it. You won't, to be perfectly honest, you're not going to hear back. He's a blunt kind of guy. Uh, he doesn't beat around the bush, and he's kind of taught us that's the best way to handle things on our end. But if he likes you, if you have a draw and you can fill some seats, then you'll have a shot. Thank you. How about uh, the bull run, George? Um, email, definitely the best way for us. Bullrungeorge at gmail.com. I don't like CDs. I used to have them, like you said, stacked up in the corner. My wife was about to divorce me. <laughs> and, uh, but I like links to your website. We, we also have it on our page, bullrunrestaurant.com. You can click on how to get booked. There's a whole page explaining the different ways you could go about it, and, you know, how to present yourself and all the aspects of what to expect. And, and I think a, a good thing when you approach someone is to be honest. You don't have a draw, and just tell me. Because the worst thing is to say, I can get 50 people in your club, and then five people show up. It doesn't help any of us, like you right. said. Yeah, it's better to <laughs> be back. Yeah, it's not, gonna, it's not gonna work out. And, and, uh, and, 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 and because we do more than blues, we do a lot of different things. There are times when I can fit people in as an opening act or here or there. We have a lot of things going on, so um, I would say be persistent and be honest. You know, contact with them. Okay. Uh, well, I would say that the majority that I book do come from probably three different agents that I typically deal with, but a lot does come in through the website. We have a, an access point there where people can send it. It goes through generic email and it, it bounces out to me and I'll look at that, but a lot of it is um, people that you can, you can, it's a standard letter and they're bouncing it out to 50 festivals. And, um, yeah. and, they, and every band that sends you information, they, they're the best band ever. So it's, you can pretty quickly decide whether that's gonna work or not, or if it's something you wanna hold on to, you put it in a folder for a while. But um, call, email, um, all that stuff's available. Uh, a couple of Facebook pages, um, uh, and, uh, the website, actually on our way here, a guy called me from New York about coming out to see the festival, he had heard about it. So he was wondering what the lineup and all that sort of thing was. So this, I'm, I'm very accessible. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to hear Say from something today. Yeah. 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 This one, I'm sorry, I'm late. Uh, I take care of the uh, classic rock side of the things, uh, the bookers. As far as the, uh, the blue side of things go, uh, Joan and Willie Gloss take care of those. Oh. They're accessible through um, email. Yeah, and, um, and just, far as what I do on Saturdays, most of the bands have been on uh, uh, rotation for years, so we pre I pretty much know them through the years, the bands that have been drawn. Do you want new bands too? Yeah, we, we, we scope out new bands and we try to, um, you know, add a couple through the years and see, see you know, what they bring to the table and, you know, they self-promote and work and, you know, along with the club. Um, but the, um, as far as getting access to us, I know Joan has the website, you know, the emails also, and, um, yeah, they, they, they know from being out, Willie knows from being out and playing bands that would work for us and bands that they thought would treat Primarily good. local? Uh, we take bands outside, bands also. Uh, it's a little tougher to draw that way, but there's so much <coughs> talent, you know, everywhere, worldwide, but even, you know, North Shore, South Shore. But it's, uh, we bring them in and we just, we see how it works and we try to get them on the rotation and if, uh, it works that way. That's, that's I want to congratulate <coughs> you on the uh, you are receiving the 2015 Boston Blues Society and keeping the Blues Alive Award. Thank you. Congratulations. I want to ask a question also. Um, are there, 
advice do you have for anyone following in your footsteps, any future promoters <coughs> out there, or any club old people who want to go into the club business? Anybody have any advice aside from don't do it? Um. <laughs> no, I encourage people to do it. I mean, uh, this, this business will die if there's not people like us exactly. to follow in our footsteps. I mean, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, I mean, you got to love what you're doing. Uh, it, it's, it's a whole lot more work than people think it is. I mean, you know, as a, as a club, you know, running, running the club or, you know, putting on festivals, I mean, uh, you're married to it. I mean, and there's not one of us up here. I mean, uh, my wife's sitting right there, but I mean, I could not do any of what I do without her support and my family's support. So uh, I'd like to give a round of applause to all our wives and spouses. <laughs> You know, I mean, it, 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 but you know, I mean, if, if, that, if that's what your heart tells you you should do and you want to do, I mean, definitely try it, and, and don't don't be discouraged in the first ten years. I mean, you, you, you gotta. I mean, uh, I, I love what I do. Uh, I've been doing it for you know uh, you know a, a lot of years. I mean, I'm, I'm one of the very uh, few fortunate that took my hobby and, ter and turned it into my living. And you know, I absolutely love what I do, and uh, I'm passionate about the blues and its its uh, its fans and the artists. And uh, uh, so, I, I encourage any one of you out there, if you're thinking of doing that, you got all our contact numbers on this on this piece of paper out there. The rest, you know, end of the room. You know, please contact us in the you know and over the rest of the today and tomorrow. You see, it's, you have questions, ask us. But I encourage anybody out there to do it. But you better be passionate, and you better have. A backup plan. I agree. Right here it says, <coughs> under this question, make sure you love what you're doing. Right there. <laughs> and we need to collaborate. <laughs> it's just a, it's a key aspect of, of being successful and, and, and alive in this business because it, you know, there's pitfalls and there's a lot to it. You just have to keep your, you, know, you have to love it. Though. It, it's, it's not just music. Um, some nights it's hand holding, some nights it's babysitting, um, and it's not audience members we're talking about, it's performers. Um, run to the store because you forgot something on the hospitality rider. All these little things, uh, you have no idea what goes on behind the scenes. And if you don't love the little things, if you don't love the minutia, if that's something that might be bothersome to you, this is not really the business. <laughs> yeah, that's what I that's what I kind of jotted down too is to enjoy it from start to finish. And the festival is over the, the this year. The festival is over. The next day you start into it. Enjoy the process from one year to the next because it's not all about that day. Because if you get to that day and it, it's raining, you know, there's a bunch of different things that could happen. You got to enjoy the whole process or try to. And start out small. Don't jump into too big because you, you, you're risking whatever you might be having for in a bank. Mm -hmm. You know, or you're putting it out there. And you're trying to get some of it back and put it out there over your head because one and done. You know, you want to start small and uh, be ready for some sleepless nights. Mm -hmm. Now I was talking to Brad Mike at breakfast, and you know I, I do consulting for vessels around the country and. And I said, within the first five minutes, I always get asked, you know, how much money do you think we're going to make? <laughs> and my, my answer to that is, how much money can you afford to lose? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and then you sit in with reality. But uh, you know, it's, it's you got to love what you do to be able to do what all of us do up here. I mean, we wouldn't be, you know, we've all been doing this, you know, for a number of years. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's been many times. My wife is, <laughs> I'm sticking on her again, but. One, one, the first time I did North Atlantic Blues Festival, we put my heart and soul in and did it and put everything into it. And, you know, of course, we lost money. And I came home and said, but next year, and she started, you know, she cried for two weeks. He put all this work in. He, 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 what do you mean next year? You lost money. Yes. At least wait a couple of weeks before you say that. <laughs> but she, she, she got over it, and, uh, you know, but, uh, but you know, it, you know it, it's a love of what we do. I mean, it's, it, you guys are fans. You love coming to shows. Well, we just do it in a different aspect. We love putting on these shows so you people could come and join. And to have maybe a good team. 
I would say a good team, if you can't, you can't do everything. And I think that that, to me, is important. I don't know if anybody down there have any other when I came, just one thing. Yeah. When I when I said I'd be interested in in looking at a new venue for a, uh, for a new club after I was out of the business for ten years, <clears throat> I was on the phone with Dan. He goes, "Charlie, you got to take a look at this club. It's great." I was just, "Really? I'm playing golf right now." <laughs> so, so I said, "Well, let me let me let me uh, let me call you back." So I. Home, uh, so I said, Dan, are you on the phone? He goes, Yeah. I said, I want you to hear because this is going to be the answer. Carol, what do you think about me getting in uh, another club and, and you know, being back where I want to be? She goes, Well, you've only been waiting 10 years, so get back, go, go, get out. <laughs> so she, uh, she was a catalyst. So yeah. I helped him pack his bag. <laughs> <laughs> But teamwork, teamwork and support. Yeah, right. Is there anything on the panel that <clears throat> anybody have a question before we get to open it up to the floor? Anybody have anything that I haven't brought up that you'd like to bring up? It's on your mind in this business. I think there's probably a lot of questions out All there right. that probably get those. So let's do it. I want to start with you because you had your hand up earlier. Oh, well, I, I was just. Uh, and do you want to stay, say your name or not say your name, whatever you want? No, that's okay. Okay. Um, For those who don't know, that's Mike Walsh's dad. That's <laughs> 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 Mike Walsh. Yeah. 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 You brought Mike to me when he was 14 years old and rocked with me. And me when he was 14 uh, and yeah. the trade was motor in. It was the timeout yeah. at the blues, yeah, at the trade wins. Yeah. 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 I remember These that. These guys carried his, uh, his amp because uh, Mike yeah. wasn't big enough to carry it. He was 11. <laughs> <term>. <laughs> oh, was he 11? <laughs> Um, uh, so, yeah. Well, my, my, what I was just thinking about uh, back then was, uh, I always think about two things. One was um, uh, WBCN and the, the old tea party on Berkeley Street. They used to bring in acts where they would have, uh, you know, Albert King with uh, Rod Stewart or something like yeah. that. And I think that had a lot to do with the explosion of the blues popularity in the 60s. And uh, the, I wondered if there's any interest in booking multiple genre type shows uh, that maybe could. Uh, you mean in the same night? Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, that's, that's I, I know in blues you typically book one or two acts. Well, you rock and roll, you book five or six. Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> kind of happening now. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the Tampa Bay Blues Festival. Uh, for instance, I'm gonna throw that one out when they have Boz Skaggs as a headliner. Right, right. Well, you yeah, know, the, 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 the Tower of Power. Oh, the Jazz Fest. Yeah, Jazz Fest. Jazz, 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 jazz Fest everything. Right. Right. So, Springsteen. But jazz. the small clubs I think he's referring to. Yeah. And um, I, I think it's a, it's something that's happening. Um, we uh, do it. Narrows do it, does it? Um, we certainly do it. We've had reggae and, <laughs> and uh, indie rock in the same night. Yeah. Um, I think, I think so it's a crossover. So. Boston is so rich with talent, musical talent. It's probably one of the best in the country. And uh, so, having uh, having inter uh, uh, inter genre nights, I think is a, is a great great way of having people see other music. And the uh, the other observation I wanted to make is I, I hope you're all getting to listen to the bands. Because I noticed John Hall is not here. So he's, the guy, he's, he's the guy that's working, and you guys. That's are right. That's right. Yeah. Um, hats off to John Hall, yeah. by the way. Yeah. Woo. Yes, Bob. Uh, my name is Bob Stanton. I'm from Vermont. I'm a blues singer and harmonica player. Just in the nick of time, as the world has a shortage of both of those. Um, <laughs> first of all, an observation. Here are uh, a whole table full of people who are, what do you do for a living? You take risks on a already risky genre, and yet you're all sitting up there thinking you're normal people. I want to speak to the education component. In about 20 days, I'm going to be uh, elected as the new chair of the Vermont Arts Council. And nice. it's going to be the first time in the history of the state that they've had a harmonica player and blues singer running the Vermont Arts Council. That has all kinds of risks associated with it. 
Um, I, too, as a person who's about to become 65 years old, have a real concern about uh, the, the aging of this genre. It's delightful to see these little kids in the front mm -hmm. row. Um, so in that regard, I have taken it upon myself to uh, find sponsors to come up with a thousand bucks. I bought 300 Honer harmonicas in the key of C. That alone is kind of strange. And I'm going into the Integrated Arts Academy, a school in the old north end of Burlington, which is a really tough section of Vermont. And I'm going to teach 300 kids how to play the harmonica in 30 minutes. Oh, Knowing full well that in that group somewhere is the next Charlie Muscle White and Kim yeah. yeah. And that's, I think that's how you do it. People that care enough about this music have to really reach out because it's a genre that has always been underground, according to my friend John Hammond. He said it's always been an underground genre. People don't, the people that appreciate this music really appreciate this music. And the rest of them are off doing whatever they're doing. So it's a, it's a huge effort. And you're all to be commended for doing what most people would consider to be insane. So thank you. Thank you for what you do. It's a good kind of insanity, yeah. About four months ago, a guy came up to me in a club, actually in Shanty Rose, and uh, he said, hey, somebody told me to talk to you about some advice about putting on a blues festival. So right away, I go, I'm not a producer. <laughs> I said, if you want to talk to somebody, I gave him a couple names. He says, well, the town's giving me some money and a date and a hall oh, to put on a one or two day blues festival. I said, when's that date? April. This is three months ago, and I said, don't take it personally, but you're pretty much dead in the water. <laughs> and, and the only reason I know that is because I, I know Paul, and I know Mike and Brad, and I know how far ahead they have to start planning. Correct. And even if it's a lot, somebody's giving you some money, somebody's giving you a haul, and, and giving you a date, if it's three months out, it's un unless you know every band in the world, mm -hmm. locally or nationally, <laughs> and you can call in some favors. And that's what I want to ask. How soon do you all start? And there's a difference between club ownership and festival production. How, what kind of advice would you give to anybody about how soon do you start? How do you kind of start a band making that make you already. Say again? I have a band book for 2017 already. Yeah. yeah. So Eight to 12 months if you're a festival, yeah. and club is... Uh, Anywhere from immediately to I'm I'm booked through the rest of the year. Yeah. For, for the time I'll pop on Monday night. Yeah, so, yeah. My my calendar is booked for the rest of the year. Well, and Paul, you're about like five or six festivals. Open Monday night. That's a good thing. Paul, you're involved in five or six festivals now. Yeah, I do. I did seven festivals last year. I'm doing six this year. And um, you need on, on startup of new festivals, you need a minimum of twelve months. To get the word out, blues fans plan a well for festivals a year in advance. They know where they're going yeah, the following year. What festival? So new festivals. If you don't give yourself, you know, he said eight to twelve months. I, I say for a new festival, give yourself a year to get your dates out there, get established, get in the right publications, and let the blues fans know about this new festival uh, because they have their favorites, uh, you know. And if it's and and, and, and look. Who you're competing against and when, because it's it's key. If you you know if you're going to come in into New England and do a new festival and you're competing <coughs> on the same weekend, it's White Mountains, Boogies, and Blues on the North Atlantic. Well, we've already established our events, and, and you're not going to take from us. Right. And so uh, you know, don't go against a, a well-established festival. You know, do your homework, and and you know, and and if you don't know how to do it, find someone who can do it for you. There's, I mean. Uh, you know, you know. Yes, I consult, but everybody up here could. Uh, you know, and it's uh, you know, you know. But you know, you really better do your homework uh, when you're going to start off brand new. I mean, you need that leeway time. You need to, you know, to get the word out to the right people. And you know, you just if you, th if you think you're going to do a festival in, in January, you're planning to do it in April. You you are right. Tell me that. Yeah, right. It's not going to happen. Especially as a first time. Yeah, it's not going to happen. Well, John Hall was really great about coordinating. That's why it's so important to know each other, coordinate what's happening when. So 
you know, it is a business. You want to, you don't want to step on each other's feet on top of it. But I just want to mention there's some wonderful publications. I mean, here's one right here. Blues Music Magazine, and on the back, North Atlantic Blues Festival. I mean, there's ways to do this. The Blues Music Guide. The, uh, you know, there's so many wonderful ways to communicate and connect and find out what's going on. Yes? This, this leads in to what you were just saying. Uh, my name is John Kleinman. I write for Elmore Magazine. I also do some writing for Living Blues. I was just wondering about your relationship to writers, journalists, and the press. Um, and opportunities for people who are writers to get involved in what you do. We all encourage it. Yeah. 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 We definitely yeah. encourage yeah. writers. <laughs> we look for people like you. <laughs> We've lost, we yeah. lost a lot. So, really. I mean, yeah. sure. We're very lucky that um, we have a young lady who, on our, um, we have a small staff, like I said earlier, we have a staff of four, but we also contract people. Um, a young lady in our area writes for a local newspaper. She does a lot of our uh, large press releases, but she also writes for the Boston Globe and um, Huffington Post. So she, I think Chris Smither, her Chris Smither article was in the Globe a couple of days ago. And I believe it's, um, as far as writers go, you know, where are you getting your, where are you getting your articles in? So, you know, you've, uh, Elmore Magazine is key for the blues. Uh, many of us, um, you know, Bullhorn and Shirley, we do a lot more than um, blues. Right. So um, we just we just need more coverage, and yeah. we we love writers. Great. Okay. Usually they contact us ahead of time, set up a place for them to come in, watch the show, yeah, write do an interview, or it can be a phoner or a live mm -hmm. interview, review the show, whatever you know. Yeah, we love it absolutely. Great. Thank yeah. you. Yes. Yeah. Um, you you kind of. Folk, or almost focusing on something I think that may be really central to you. And you all say that you're trying to draw this next generation in. Don't forget that that next generation was largely a plugged in generation. And to me, that's the problem. They don't know live music. What you've got to promote is live music. You know, the, the concept of, you know, you ain't heard music until you've heard live music. That's what's missing in their lives. Because you, you could take almost any of them, and if you expose them to live music, it's like, whoa, where is this band? Yes, we, you can promote it all you, till the cows come home. But you have to get them in the building. One of the things that we do at the Narrows is uh, we're a 501c3, we're a nonprofit. We do get uh, money from Mass Cultural Council. We bring in school kids. During the day, uh, Mark T. Small, who is a, a blues musician, he will give a lesson to a group of school kids. Um, he'll do a question and answer. He will do history of the blues. He's a tremendous blues historian. Uh, so through cultural grants, we're able to bring students into the Narrows during the day. I meant it in the, in the, in the, in the concept of you all working together promoting live music, not promoting your venue or your festival, but everybody promoting live music, because that's what's dying. Live music is dying. Get people out of their houses. I totally disagree with you. Okay. Live well, music is not dying. Well, the live music are. is not dying. We none of us would be here this, this, this weekend. The, where are all the venues going? Not some of the venues are closed, but live music has not gone anywhere. It's evolved, but live music is alive and well. In the clubs that still exist. Right, but because it's there's fewer and fewer there. of them, and yeah. people won't drive to go to, to any distance to go to live music. Right, and shop on the club scenes for sure. Club scenes are definitely hurting. Compared, I mean, an artist in the blues world, ten years ago, could go out on a 30-day tour and play 28 dates. A blues artist this day and age goes out on a 10-day tour and plays three dates, if they're lucky. So I totally agree with you in the club aspect of it. There's a lot less clubs than there were 20 years ago, but there's a whole lot more festivals than there were 20 years ago. Oh, and so, I'm 40 <coughs> miles out of the city, and I get people to drive way further than 40 miles to come to our shows constantly. Yeah. Yeah, Monday Night Blue from Series. New Hampshire, from uh, you know, Rhode Island, Connecticut. It's you know me, I'm at, I'm at, I'm at Bull Run all the time. Right, right. But I go down to the Narrows, 
I very rarely see people that from Bull Run at the Narrows, and the Narrows people aren't at Bull Run. Well, they don't have They're not to. that they far away. Yeah, they have a lot of the same shows, yeah, the same shows so they don't exactly. have to overlap. Yeah, so we're far enough apart. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if I had to depend on yeah. a local crowd for my Monday night, I've been doing Monday Night Blues for 30 years. If I had to depend on a local crowd, right. town crowd. I would not be yeah. open. Right. Right. Yeah. My blues fans travel an hour to two hours each way to my Monday night shows, they're seven o'clock shows, they're done at right. 10, but they, they travel <coughs> 50 to 100 miles, you know, <coughs> trips every one of my shows. I, I probably have a, a 15 to 20 person, local people who show up at my Monday night show, and I have 75 people who travel an hour each way. So, it's all, you know, they're maniacs. Now, you are in an area where you have to drive an hour to get to anything. <laughs> <laughs> you have to go to the grocery store. <laughs> you know, that's, but, that's, but, but people, if you bring in good entertainment, people will come. Excuse me. Yes. Hi. Uh, me and uh, Fall River. And uh, he's talking, and we do the Narrows, and go to Chance, and Chance, you go and shake hands and say hello to all the people, because that's interchangeable. But I'm retired, and I work part-time, and I work with a younger crowd, and these people don't know live music. They don't. They're 30 years old and less, and have never been to a show. You know, and so we're talking about this. Talk. I don't know how to get them in. I got to grab them by the hand and pull them in. Is the only way I could. Yeah. I can personally do it. And I think once they see a show, they're like, "Wow!" You know, like a That's light goes out. Right. But yeah. they, if you talk to them, they don't know. They listen to music that don't have instruments in it. You know what I mean? It's, <laughs> Well, they're not playing the Thunder Road. Okay. No hip hop. One and two. Yeah. Oh, I, I was just going to say they're, they're used to uh, DJs. They're used. To, they're not used to hearing any music that isn't exactly what they've heard before. They're lazy listeners. They're used, they want to hear it note for note, and, or they want to hear DJs. I have a 22-year-old who moved to New Orleans a couple months ago for that exact reason. She wants to be out hearing live music. Well, she grew up in it in five, like five generations, and as you guys are. But she, she's like breathing it in every minute. Right, right. And, and I, you know, keep telling everybody else. She's the one you can't. Yeah. Is this a question and answer period now? Yes. yes. I, I, I'm back at the IBCs and here in Black and Black. I wanted to ask you guys before, the club owners especially, how many times do you give up an act of a performance, a slot, um, if they're, how long do you give them to build an audience? In other words, I mean, how many they, times come, how many they, times they come back? Yeah, I mean, if they come the first time and they bring sixty people, is that worth bringing them? I mean, I watch as they build. If what? they're building, yeah. I work with them. So would you give them two or three? Yeah, if they're building, and I work with them. I'm saying if they plateau, I even work with them a little bit. But if they, if they're dropping or they don't grow, then I can't. I can't carry them forever. Right. If they need to self-promote that and work at it as well, sure. Yeah. You know, years ago, you used to just come and things would work out. You know, you could come into a club and you didn't have to work at it. Bars would be packed all the time. But now, if they don't self promote and put the effort in along with the club, then we don't usually get that response. So, if they're doing that, then I'll work with them. You know, to most clubs today, uh, they're destination clubs. I mean, people are going there to see a specific act. They're not going there. I mean, back in. Back in the 80s, people used to come to Harpers Ferry just because they knew that they were going to get good music, but a great music and, and, and good music. But that was on the corner of Harvard Avenue and Brighton Avenue. Exactly. So it was like, you, you, had, I mean, you had people walking in that didn't even know what right. they were, yeah. wanted to listen to. They didn't care. Yeah. So, but at the, not every place has that. Right? I certainly don't now. And, and, and but it's, it's so most clubs are destination clubs. Yeah. You have to work at it. That's right. Location and advertising. Yeah. So I think right. too, for, oh, yeah. the, for the performer, um, it comes down to money. Right. I don't know what, you, you know, all <coughs> the contracts are different. Right. There may be a guarantee um, and then a percentage. Right. You know, you reach a certain amount of door sales and then we give you X amount of percentage over that. If, that, if they're not making that percentage and they're driving, they're in their van, six of them packed into a van with their equipment, and they're driving eight hours between gigs. Yeah. Is it worth it for them? 
So they have to look at it that way too. Thank you. I mean, I, I give bands, uh, you know, two or three times, you know, they're, they're, like he said, if they're, if they're building, you know, if I bring them in the first time, they have 80 people, and I bring them back the second, I have 40. They're not coming back a third time. Right. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, it's just, but it, 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 it's a business on their end, too. Couple more. Uh, yes, Kayla. Hi. Um, I'm coming from a younger person's perspective. I just wanted to throw it in there. Um, tonight, this evening, I invited a couple of friends, and they're not able to come because they can't afford the ticket price. Right. Um, I'm just saying, add on to what, to what you had said, of course the artist has to make money. Absolutely, the venue has to make money too. I'm not sure how that works, but um, I just wanna say that like, maybe you guys could do like a kids get in free night. Kids could be <laughs> determined as like anyone kids. younger than 25 or something, you know, just to spread, just, I don't know, <laughs> just whatever you guys think because I don't have a cover charge. <laughs> See, exactly. If there's no yeah. cover charge, you could get a following of younger kids. Yeah, there's there's a lot they don't want to run to mom and dad and say, oh, can I have 60 bucks to go to this blues festival? You know, they're probably not going to yeah. say that. But if you say, oh, it's, it's free and we can come and we can have a couple of drinks and watch some great music, um, you know, whatever it is. Um, That's a good idea, Kayla. You can introduce it on college campuses. Introduction, <laughs> exactly. Like a couple of little things. And even like downstairs here, you know, the, the blue societies. I agree. These are this, these are all great ideas. Anybody else? As we, we start to wrap up. All right. Well, yes. Uh, my name is Ed Stack. I'm with Connecticut Blue Society. Sometimes I'll I'll get a call from a venue, and they'll say, "Well, we get a chance to bring such and such a guy in. Uh, what do you think?" And that brings up the dilemma that you're frequently uh, faced with in the, in the clubs, it may be some I know that the guy's really good, mm -hmm. but I also know that nobody in town knows the guy. Yeah. So, you know, I gotta be honest, I gotta say, this guy's terrific, but he's not gonna draw anything. Now, some, some of the club owners are real fans of blues, and they'll extend themselves and, and bring in an occasional guy, knowing that they're not gonna make a lot of money, but their, their true fans will appreciate the, the fact that they're bringing in a guy and then maintain the fact that they're a premier blues club because they're bringing in somebody who's really good. Yeah. But the point is, how often can you do that knowing you're not gonna make any money? Sometimes I have a night that I don't have things booked or I'll have a slow night and I will take a chance on somebody with, for a door deal. I'll tell them, you come in for a percentage of the door. We're both taking the risk. And maybe if you people will, it'll build. That's what I'm hoping for. And if people like you, then the next time you come back, we can, you know, and more people will know of you, and you'll start to build. That's how it grows. And I do that. I do put people on like that. And sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. And it's not only yeah. always a young guy. It no, no, be an no, older no, guy. Yeah. You've got to be yeah. more yeah. familiar. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he's excellent. Yeah. Yeah. It's no. also very tough on the club on the side of it when you get a band that's so talented and you want it to work, yeah. but the draw's just not there. Right. It's really tough. Sometimes yeah, you no question. You think this is a, this is a no brainer. Yeah. But part of that too, on, on the festival side, especially if you want to sneak a band in, like we have five five bands on Saturday, four bands on Sunday this year. You want to sneak a band in that you know is really good and it's an award winning band, you can sell them. You can sell that aspect of who they are um, because that gives them some recognition. They may not have heard of them, but it's mm -hmm. it's something that the ties could bring, them, bring people in before that. We have a guy coming in from the UK this year, Lawrence Jones. Uh, he's won the last two years British Blues Award for Young Artist of the Year. And he's right up, up now for last week was nominated for a guitarist award. He's coming in, so he's got a little bit of that with him. And um, um, he's also played uh, quite a bit with Walter Trout. Walter Trout likes him, has quoted him a number of, uh, quoted him a number of times. So if you can tie those things in, sometimes that will draw people in and then they see them and wow, this guy's fantastic. So that's what I hope for. But I, I like to bring in a couple of those so-called unknowns or bands that I would love people to see. <coughs> and and, the, and the, the great part about that is when they see what I see mm -hmm. um, the day of, and that's the satisfaction. I saw Charlie awesome. Acord at your festival, and I was blown away. From and I saw Canadian him at Paul's <laughs> festival. <laughs> that's what we were talking earlier oh, today. Yeah, he saw him at festival, yeah. yeah. Blown away. We may bring somebody in as an opener. Right. And... Um, 
see how the audience reacts. We brought someone in last night, and she was a word of mouth recommendation, and she came <coughs> in, and she'll come back, and then from there she'll be a co-bill, and then from there she'll be a headliner. Well, we're going to wrap up. Question? Yes. I just uh, number one live music. I don't think it's dying either. There's there's not one night a week where I can't find a good band playing within an hour of my house. Monday through Sunday, there's always something going on. And you have to be willing to buy the ticket, or you have to be willing to drive the hour. You know, it's not going to be right outside your door. But my main question is for the festival people, and is it, a, is it a logistics question? What's wrong with July? I mean, Paul, I know you have a festival in July, but you also have one in August. Everybody else has August. August. We do ten festivals in August, sometimes two festivals a weekend. And then they overlap, yes. you know, the boogie and, and the blues and brews. What's wrong with the last couple of weeks in July? <laughs> to, why doesn't somebody book festivals, you know, the last couple of weeks of July? Is it because the bands are, are here in August? I mean, couldn't they come a couple of weeks earlier? And J July primary for a lot of bands is the last two weeks in July, Europe is huge. Okay. Yeah. Artist. And and uh, I, I've been to you know the same weekend you know first full weekend after Fourth of July week since the beginning. Uh, you know, but and I then I do a festival first week in right. August. You know, Massachusetts. You know, but but uh, bands that go to Europe will get paid three times the money they get paid in the United States. <coughs> oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And so uh, we're competing with that. And then with us, we're all in New England. We all know that we got a three month window. And so we are going to overlap with festivals, wow. which is unfortunate. But you know, I mean, you know, what I do in Maine is not going to affect what's going on in Massachusetts. But you know, I mean, my my August festival this year with Gloucester, we're competing with two other festivals yeah, the same huh? day. Uh, you know, which is unfortunate, but that's you know, that's the, in the <coughs> nature of the beast because we got a three month window with weather. We're all taking a huge risk putting on outdoor events, and it, you know, in, in New England's you know three to four month window of chance to do outdoor shows and I mean, you know it's I mean but that's one of the bigger reasons what bands are hard to get at the end of July in Europe. Europe. Europe is yeah. huge. This they can go out to Europe for them two weeks and make you know a hundred grand. That's why a lot of them are hard to get basically anyway for the rock stars over in Europe. What about but June? It's nice I think and June. There's also still yeah. this like Paul was saying he's got the Gloucester Fest of the first weekend of August. And I think there's a respect factor. Um, I have been looking at Mr. Sip for a little while to have him in this year. Because right when I heard he was at Gloucester, I said, That's, it's not happening. You know, part of it's, it's the respect aspect of it, but it's also the draw. I mean, if someone can see someone two weeks earlier and it not works their schedule, maybe they're not going to come back to another festival and see him. It really depends on who that is. But that's part of what you juggle when you're putting together a festival, an event like that is, is you know it's the rooting. You might start a route um, for a band, or you might be getting on the tail end of it. There's been many times too uh, with White Mountain. There's, there's bands that have played up there, and then they could play us the following weekend. And I'll make a judgment call and say, you know, yes or no. But it's it's a decision you got to make. Yeah, routing is huge for us, uh, whether it be club owners or uh, or festival producers. Uh, like Joe Lewis Walker's agent called me or my booking staff to play uh, when? You, you, oh, before, uh, before or after this. May 6th. And I said, there's no way I'm, I'm doing that to John. So yeah, that's not your birthday. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Uh, after this, yeah. Yeah. No, I know, I'm just wondering if they were asking something. No, 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 I'm, I'm just, just saying that I was going to be where we were I didn't at. want to do that to John Hall because John is putting on this. There's there no way. So the, the routing uh, is got to do with, um, you know, area. And the booking. I was looking at, at, at Samantha Fish, and I know you have Samantha in there a number of times, and they asked me, is that too close to you? What is the time window? What is the mileage window that you're willing to work in? And you want to make, it's a, it, like most people have said that it's a family. We want everybody to be successful. Um, and uh, you don't want to make enemies and, and, and hurt everybody's job. Well, that's why it's so important. To, I feel this is important to do this yeah. and coordinate, see what we look like. I've met people who I'm friends with on Facebook. All oh, right, that's who you are. You know, so I think it's 
of the White Mountain Boogie and Blues Festival, I know that I'm going to have to take it over. <laughs> Will change, or the people will change, or your taste, the technology. But even just having you think about it, you're way ahead of a lot of other people right. who haven't even gotten there. Yeah. It's so. great. It's great to hear Thank you say that because yeah. my wife and I talk about that. You know, in my festival, and I'm 63. I got plenty of years to go. But it's not one of my kids that's interested in it at all. <laughs> I mean, they don't. You know, I mean, they go and it's like, hey. <laughs> oh, Brad. That's always a motivation. <laughs> but I mean, I would love to have one of my. I mean, I have one grandson who's licensed him on stage. He's escorted Shamika on stage a few times, and he's got a picture in his in his, in his room, and you know. So, but you know, I mean, but, but it's really nice to hear a young. You know, how old are you? Ten. Ten years old. That's my grandson will be ten, in, you know, in August. But it, it's nice to hear that you're already planning. On helping these guys out down the road. Yeah, so cool. yeah. awesome. I commend you. That's really great. Woo! Hey, take a big job. Another failure. Just remember, you know, you're going to end up looking like this. <laughs> 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 he's, he's got a ways to go, though. Yeah. Going go forward, Jake. Let us support. Well, a couple more questions. Who wants money now? Thank you. My <laughs> <laughs> little girl just looked at me and said, Paul, oh, hey. this Thanks, Paul. So anyway, I can get him there. Terry, do you have a final question well, this, there, Thought? Yeah, this, this is a, a number of years ago. Uh, somebody that I that I used to date it was, a, it was a booker, still is a, a booker yeah. for a band. That's why I like And it. in a contract that she had to read, and this is a fairly new festival producer, and I won't say who, who it was, but he had in his contract something like, you, you as a, we will hire you if you do not play any other clubs or any other festivals within yeah. 400 yeah. miles in like a 30 day window. Mm -hmm. yeah. And personally, I mean, I didn't know anything about contracts at that time. But when I read that, that blew me away. And I understand up to a point but in 30 days seemed huge it, within a 500 mile radius. Miles, or yeah. Yeah. That, 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 that is ridiculous. Yeah. I agree with you 100%. Maybe something that's happening on Long Island right now. That's terrible. I, I mean, that. you mm -hmm. know, as promoters, I mean, that's it's happening on Long Island yeah. right now. When you're looking at your headliners, the band, you know, but you have your opening acts, I mean, I let them play 70 miles away if it can help them get, get to my event. Right. I just exactly. don't want. You know, if I got Robert Cray or you know playing, I don't want Robert playing in the next town and yeah. the next night. Yeah. But you know, but the other bands coming in, blues artists, <laughs> they're not making you know a good you know a good living you know doing what they're doing. So you have to help them get. I mean, I, I help them book other dates coming right. up to the festival. So the guy that you know the guy that put. I mean, t t all right, I'm a Tampa Bay Blues Festival. Yeah. I manage a couple artists and uh, and. He has a six month, it's three months prior and three months after his date that you cannot play within a hundred miles of his festival. Oh and I, you know, and one of the artists that I, that I managed, Biscuit Miller, you know, was gonna play my festival, play a festival I put on in Bradenton. Right, yeah. And I couldn't have my own artist play my bill because he was Bay. playing in Tampa Bay. And so I, I called him and let him explain to him that, you know, he plays two or three months a year down in Florida, and he needs those dates to make a living yeah. and to cut that. So I got him to cut off 30 days, I mean, three enough, months, so it was a three-month period. Yeah. 
but he, he, he had a six month, because it was three months before and three months after, yeah. which is one of the toughest places, ridiculous, yeah. I mean, for an artist who can't do that. Wow. So, you know, it, it's all negotiable, but there are some festivals that put that in there. They're built. I personally do not. Yeah. And I don't think anybody up here does. Yeah. But we do watch out for our headliners. Yeah. So yeah. And you have a working press period. Yeah. One and then two, and then we've got to wrap up. Yeah. My name's Mike Harmon. Uh, I drove up from uh, Pennsylvania, six hour trip. I belong to the Bucks County Blues Society, yeah, the oldest blues funny. society in America. <laughs> I was speaking to Art uh, earlier today. I went on the first uh, rhythm and blues cruise through the Mediterranean over 20 years ago, and I've seen how. Uh, Festivals and uh, uh, blues cruises, for that matter, have changed. Um, I, I go to a football game to see a football game. I don't go to a football game to see a baseball game. I go to a blues festival to see blues. Why do I, and I drove up here, you know, uh, just to see certain bands. Uh, I don't want to go to a blues fest in Tampa Bay that I went to years ago to see Nothing against these artists, but they're not blues in my book. To see J.J. Grow and Mofro, Michael Frianti, why do they book those bands at a blues festival? Uh, some of them is economical. I mean, they have to get that crossover crowd, so they, 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 they kind of uh, stray. I mean, you know, Tampa Bay is a good example. I, I, to me, they ought to call it the Tampa Bay Music Festival. Right. Right. Ottawa Blues Festival, which should be one of the best festivals in Canada, now it should be the Auto Music Festival because their blues stage is the smallest of their three stages. So they keep in that blues name, but some of them, commercially wise, are, are to get that crossover crowd, have to go outside the box. And you know, and you know, <coughs> that's what I do. I try to keep them all blues. Right. I, I know these guys. You know, how I mean, you define the blues. So right, the blues is such a wide, tight definition. Yeah. Of the I mean, blues. I brought Bo well, Diddley. Have a when we talk Bo Diddley. Most people won't consider Bo Diddley a blues act, right. but right. Bo Diddley right. belongs on a blues festival. Oh, but you know, we talked. I don't know if you were here earlier. Two years ago, Boz Skaggs and Tower of Power were the headliners at the Tampa Bay Blues Festival. They're not blues bands. Well, you know, you take take for example Jazz Fest. Yeah. Is jazz fest all jazz? Oh, no, 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 not even close. No. Yeah, exactly. That's a oh, There's the financial. It's just, you know, it's a play on words, <coughs> and if you, if, you, if, if you get disappointed like that in the future, yeah. I would just check out the bands that are going to be playing. Talk and I understand, what you, I understand what you mean. Totally you know, you're you right. Mean. If you go to a football game, you should see football. But, you know, in, in this particular uh, uh, situation, I would just check out. The bands make sure they're all blues bands, so you don't yeah, get to pick and choose the best because there are not blues festivals that do blues. I mean, I gotta fly all the way to Portland, Oregon to see it a good festival. Yeah, I mean, to get a good, good variety of blues. I mean, except for an August, <coughs> well, August, <laughs> yeah. 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 Come up, guys, right here, spend the whole month here. Yeah. Come up, you know, come up in July and May. You know, there's no place know. better than in New yeah. Hampshire in, in the summertime, man. No place. So, Laura Carboni. Our final um, question. Just, just a question. Just, I'm Laura Carbone. I'm Carbone. sort of been very thankful to Paul that I sort of started a little venue in Plattsburgh called Plattsburgh Blues and Jazz, and then we're going to have a blues weekend. Plattsburgh, New York. Yeah. And people are real appreciative in my hometown. They've never seen it coming, and that have been getting great artists like Biscuit Miller bringing them back for the third time. Man, they, they love them. The brand new record. And I, when is yes. your festival? When is oh, your get together it's, weekend? It's, it's the 29th and 30th. Well, well, we're totally not prepared. And one of our questions is how to approach this because we're a non for profit. It really means not for profit. And we're looking at sponsors and sponsorship for both hotels. <coughs> like I sit there and I go, how am I going to pay for all these people in hotels and, and also restaurants and uh, and just, just in general? And so I've been asking my friends, hey, give you some money. How do you handle sponsorship? Well, that's a whole other Our best thing, my, yeah. the festival that I, that I work at is a non profit. Yeah. Um, so I, mean, I can talk to you a little bit about that. And, and I'm, a, I'm a for profit festival, uh, in knowing uh, I can, we have a program we put together for sponsorship. I mean, right. you, you got to have something to sell. Yeah, we, have, we need to do a program that works. Yeah, you, need, so you need to have something to sell and sponsor to make them more, you know what I mean? And, and in my case, because I'm a for profit festival, <coughs> you know, a lot of big businesses or big companies will only give to nonprofits. In that case, I go after their advertising budget. I say, you are, you have an advertising budget. 
you can put this on the on your advertising budget and then they support I mean uh, you know if you look at the back of you know actually I'll give you one of the brochures I mean you know the, these are all sponsors of North Atlantic and but they're not you know and and, and a lot of them are banks you know and banks don't give the not the, you know but they're banks in my backyard and feel they want to be part of that vessel so they use their advertising budget to be a sponsor you know so you, you can play with sponsorship in a number of different ways, but I'll be happy to talk to you as well. Right. Too. That's, that, that's why I, I think yeah. uh, it's great. We, we need to. We do need to wrap it up. We, we, are, um, we are a nonprofit venue. We do a one-day festival, and we tap out the banks, the local banks, because they want to see you succeed. And I think I'd like to invite you to stay and talk to the panelists. And that's why this is such an important event to connect, and and I really. Uh, Really, I'm so excited that so many people came to our first panel, and I thank you. Um, John's right over there. John is Stand up, John. John. Oh. Oh. I want to thank our panelists, each and every panelist, Charlie Abel, Paul Benjamin, Mike and Brad Benton, Kathy Spencer, John McKinnon, Eddie Page, Jordan Tachi, and Holly Harris. Holly Harris. Thank you. And Mojo Mo Productions <laughs> Joe Marino and Laura. It takes photographers, it takes musicians, it takes panelists, it takes blue societies, it takes writers, it takes all of us together. Can I keep this alive? And I just really want to say we have a couple all day, but I want to go hear some music and enjoy the rest of this first annual Blue Summit. Thank you for coming. Thank you.